Hello and welcome to the first session of our CFD simulation for AEC applications workshop by SimScale, Windwind Engineering and McNeil, the makers of Rhinoceros 3D. My name is Milad and I'm very happy to see so many people who have joined uh, through our journey through the world of simulation and architecture. And before we actually start to dive in, in today, our today's topic, I would like to make sure that the technical things are working properly and that everybody can hear me loud and clearly. Guys, we're using a software called GoToWebinar to, to broadcast this live webinar. And every one of you now should see a, a control panel in front of him. And I would just like, uh, ask, like to ask you if you can please click the raise your hand button to show me that everything is working fine. And you will find this button on your GoToWebinar control panel. Great, I already see some hands and some people have reacted in the question uh, toolbox. Great, in the case you have questions, you can write them all the time into our question uh, uh, box and we will try to answer them on the fly or uh, at the latest during the Q&A. Um, just because some people asked, yes, we will record this webinar and send the recording later to all registrants. However, we recommend you to join since this is a unique chance to get in touch with industrial experts and ask your questions. Great, since everything seems to work, let's take a look at our today's agenda. And as you know, the topic of our today's session is wind comp for prediction with CFD. And we have a lot of registrants. We are basically overwhelmed by the reactions from you. And basically, let me just tell you some, some words about the idea of this workshop. So we saw that there is a big need uh, for education regarding simulation and fluid flow simulations for architects and construction engineers. And therefore, we joined forces with Windwind Engineering and Rhino to develop this unique course concept. And the idea is that uh, participants will really learn the fundamentals of simulation and be able to apply this technology after um, taking part at all three sessions. And every session will focus on a different aspect. And today we will start our journey and talk about WinComp4 and how it can be simulated with CFD and SimScale. Therefore, let's take a look at the agenda. So first of all, at the beginning, I will give you a very short and crisp introduction to the world of CFD. So what is CFD and uh, how can we use simulation in engineering and architecture? Uh, after this part, I'm very happy that today Per joined as uh, the CEO of WindWind, a uh, leading consulting company from Denmark for wind engineering. And Per will give you introduction to, to the idea of wind comfort, discuss a different concept with you, how to measure wind comfort, and show you uh, how important uh, wind comfort can be for modern design projects. And finally, we will do a live demo where we will show you how easy and quickly you can set up a CFD simulation yourself. We will take a look at some CFD results, some simulation results to understand how they can help us to gain uh, important information during the design process. And finally, we have time for all your questions and answers. Great, so let's get started uh, with our part about the fundamentals of CFD. And let me say a few words before we actually start to talk about uh, the details. Um, CFD basically stands for computational fluid dynamic. And in the end of the day, it's a kind of virtual experiment, which we do on a computer to understand how a fluid flow will behave. And the roots from CFD come from aerospace and automotive industry, or generally speaking, from mechanical engineering. And in the last years, more and more industries started to adopt also CFD. And uh, it looks like architecture becomes more and more interested in. So first of all, what is CFD used for? Basically, you can use CFD for everything which is related to fluid flow. So on the slide, you can just find a few examples of, of simulation of physical effects which were predicted and analyzed using uh, computational fluid dynamics simulation. 
for example, uh, Formula One car, which you can see here on the slide, which is maybe a very good example because motorsports and F1 racings were basically one of the main drivers of, of uh, CFD and simulation technology in the past. And still, uh, simulation is the essential tool to optimize and predict the shape of the race cars in a bi-weekly bi cycles from race to race. But CFD is not only uh, limited to aerodynamics. It can also be used to, to investigate fluid flows from, from liquids, for example. Uh, here on the example you can see the heat and, and mass transfer inside the heat exchanger, which is, for example, used in larger buildings as a part of the heating system. And it can also be used to understand why uh, uh, or how uh, 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 heat exchanger exactly working and to optimize the performance of the heat exchanger with respect to the energy consumption um, or the total rate of, of, of energy which is transferred. And there are basically unlimited possibilities uh, for, for using CFD. And basically, uh, you can apply CFD simulation everywhere where you're dealing with a physical problem which is driven by a fluid flow. And it can also be used for, for let's say, more complex uh, applications like uh, marine ship hull design, where you even simulate the interaction between the free uh, stream on the water and how the water interacts with the rigid body of the boat. And CFD is, as I mentioned, a quite old technology, which becomes uh, more and more important in the last years. And uh, CFD today is mainly used at big companies. And there's a reason why they're using this technology, because it's really adding a lot of value. And I really love this, this chart you can see on the left side, because it really summarizes why and how simulation can help to make the difference when it comes to design products, building, or other technical things. Um, to put it in a nutshell, simulation allows you to create better products in a shorter time, uh, a shorter period of time with a smaller budget. But how is it working? Well, um, as I mentioned, this graph is quite pretty because you can basically apply it on every technical design process. And on the x-axis, we can see the time. So the, the physical time, like, and also you can see different stages of the design process, like the concept, definition, scheme design, detail planning, and bidding in the end, if you talk about building project, for example. But if you take a look at the project costs, which are plotted on the y-axis, um, you, will, you will obviously notice something. And the yellow chart, is represent, uh, the black chart, is representing how the costs are planned. And if you think about it, when you have a building project, all the cost, most of the cost, needs to be calculated and planned up front of the project because you need all this information in the end of the day um, to submit your offer, for example, for this uh, building project. And on the other hand, if you think about the realization of the building and also the realization of the costs, most of the costs are occurring not at the beginning of the project, but at the end, because at the beginning, when you do this concept studies, uh, you just you maybe have just a team of two or three people working on the project, and you have a lot of options you can discover. But when you are at the end stage of this development process, let's say you're defining the details and preparing the bidding, um, every decision has a big impact on your cost. And at this stage of the product development, let's say uh, maybe 20, 30, 40 people working on it, so, so what is the consequence? What is the, the information this chart is giving us? Most of the costs of a project are planned based on gases at the very beginning, but they are occurring at a very late stage of the project. And this is a very big challenge basically for all engineers in the world, independent in which industry they are working. And Having simulation allows you to test a lot of concepts in the early stage and to do a lot of experiments and understand your problem. And depending on project and roads, this gives a lot of benefits, like it reduces the overall costs. It helps you, for example, for a building project to lower your energy consumption because you can uh, really you can virtually investigate different ventilation concepts. It also helps you to, in the end of the day, to lower your failure risk. Sometimes you're not interested in improving something, but you want really to make sure that it will work, and their CFD and simulation can really help. And the tools can be basically used across all, let's say, roles in a, 
a construction or building project. So architects can use it to better understand their design and to understand uh, which impact their design and the shaping of the building has, let's say, on the physical loads which needs to be considered during the planning. And engineers can use it to get a higher confidence and re reduce the failure risk. And that's the great thing about simulation and why a lot of big companies are using it for a longer time now because it definitely gives them a big competition advantage. And now let's talk about the last aspect of the theory of CFD, how does it work? And this is a very good question. And basically, they are causes at universities and books just focusing on the question, how does CFD work? And let me try to explain it to you very quickly in a very simple language. Because in the end of the day, you are interested in applying these technologies, not necessarily in understanding them completely. So what is CFD? Let me try to explain it based on the story of CFD as a history. So, the idea of CFD is that we want to virtually predict and calculate the uh, behavior of a fluid flow. And there is some good or some bad news. The good news is that basically there is, a, uh, is an equation which was like uh, founded more than 200 years ago by two scientists. And this equation called Navier-Stokes equation, which is very complex, you can see it here. And don't worry if you don't understand what it expresses. Um, but in simple words, this equation says nothing more or less than that if you have a, a system, a physical system uh, you, are you are taking a look at, that in, inside the system uh, there can't be mass or energy or momentum generated or destroyed. It can only be converted into another form of energy, for example. And therefore, mass, momentum and energy of a fluid flow needs, seem, needs to be stay constant or how uh, uh, engineers uh, 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 are saying, there is a conservation of mass, momentum, and energy inside the fluid flow, which is very simple. It's just based on, on the really fundamentals of physics we learned at school, that energy and mass can't be created or destroyed. So in the end of the day, what is CFD doing? We have these equations, but the big problem is um, we cannot solve them. And if we want to solve them, we have to simplify them, that which means we will not calculate velocity and pressure, which is in the end what we're interested in. That is our result, velocity and pressure field around a building, for example. And these two fields are not calculated for the whole continuum for the infinite number of points around the building, but only for a number of defined control volumes inside the domain, which means we are dividing our physical problem, which is very complex, into a lot of small sub-problems, and we are reassembling it based on very simple uh, uh, shapes, like uh, hexahedras here. And the idea of CFD is that we, in the end of the day, reduce our complex problem to a lot of small problems. And basically, that's the whole idea. And this is also why the CFD process or simulation process is looking like it is. So at the very beginning, we have a CAT model or design model. And then we need to create the so-called MASH, which is describing the local accuracy of our simulation. So on this uh, picture in the middle, you can see it. The fluid domain around the building was extracted. And now we have divided in, into a lot of small volumes of, of uh, pieces of volume. And you can see that these elements are smaller in the near of the building, in the near of sharp edges. Uh, than uh, in the areas far away from the building. And that has a reason because the, the size of these elements is in the end somehow representing our accuracy because only for each cell we only calculate one global value inside the cell for pressure and velocity, which means everywhere we expect to have large changes, for example, uh, in the near of the building because there the flow is interacting with the building, there we need a fine mesh. And once we have prepared our mesh, we need to define the physics, like where is the air coming in, where is it going out. It's more or less like telling your, your guesses and assumptions to the computer program, to the software. And then finally, the simulation is calculated, which is a huge mathematical problem, which can take up to days to solve if you do it on a, on a small computer. And finally, you will receive a simulation result. And during the so-called post-processing, you are now able to, to really to dive in into every small area of, of your fluid flow domain and to really investigate and, and, and learn about the, the behavior of the flow, the fluid flow velocity, and the pressure for nearly every point of your domain. 
In the case you have questions related to that, just write in the text box, in the question box, and I will try to answer it as quick as possible. Now we have learned basically what simulation is, what possibility it gives to engineers and architects, and also about the benefits that and the value simulation can add to a product or building development process. And from what I said, uh, you you need. I think you you think now that oh, simulation is great. And let me tell you now something which will maybe shock you. Simulation is still not a standard tool in, in engineering. And this chart here really represents um, the current situation about the adoption of simulation. So here again, on the, on the uh, x-axis, you can see time starting from the early 1970s until today. And on the y-axis, you can see the software adoption industry in percent. So zero means nobody, no engineer in the world is using this technology. And 100% means standard, which every engineer is using. And now on this chart, you can see how three technologies which are very, very familiar developed in the years. All of them were basically developed between the early 70s and the late 70s and the orange uh, uh, graph is showing the adop adoption of 2D CAD. And as you can see it was developed in the 70s and it took some time around 10 years and after 10 years it became a standard and you can see like how the growth of adaption increased over the time. So we had like an adoption after 10 years, like 20%, 15% of engineers were using simulation. And 10 years later, already 90% were using it. And since the, the beginning of the 90s, 2D CAD is the standard. It's even more than a standard. It's basically outdated. Today, only a few uh, industries are using 2D CAD still. And one of them is architecture, which is mainly using it for data exchange with suppliers. And also, with the, when BIM will become more accepted, 2D CAD uh, will continuously shrink and be not being used anymore. Six, seven years later, 3D CAD was also introduced. And basically, it's the same kind of curve, just a little bit uh, translated, uh, panned to the right side. So again, at the beginning, there was a very low adaption and then it, it really increased very quickly. And here you can see some technolo technological um, game changers which are responsible for this high adoption. Like 2D CAD was mainly driven by Autodesk releasing the 1982, the first um, CAD system which was available on personal computers. 3D CAD was the same. It was SolidWorks in the early 90s releasing the first 3D CAD, bringing simulation 3D CAD for Windows bringing simulation to the public. But if you take a look at simulation, adoption is still very low. Also, it was basically invented at the same time like 2D CAD. And there are several reasons. One, and the, maybe the biggest reason, is the so-called access barrier. Um, if you want to get started with simulation today, it's a huge, um, uh, huge um, process you have to start. You need to, to buy, deploy, and maintain dedicated simulation hardware, very powerful servers and computer which are able to perform this large calculations. You need software license and the license manager. It's not as easy as using Rhino, so you really need to buy the software, sign a contract, then they send your license key and take a lot of time. And it's not taking a lot of time, and it's, but it's also very, very expensive. Traditional simulation tools comes with very high fixed expenses for, for software, hardware, and training. You have to pay an annual license fee for the software license. You have to pay leasing or, or leasing uh, or, or, or maintenance uh, costs for your hardware, and you have to train your, your people to, to be able to use it. And also a very big problem is the so-called know-how barrier, even if simulation would be much cheaper with traditional tools. Um, a lot of people would not be able to leverage it since they have a lack of know-how and most of simulation tools are designed for simulation experts but not for designers, engineers and architects. And that is, uh, these are the three reasons why simulation is still not an industry standard. And basically here the, the, the history of SimScale starts of our company and we've developed the first so-called cloud-based simulation because we saw there is a big need of simulation capabilities but all the other simulation vendors are only targeting a fraction of the market offering very expensive high-tech tools which are not affordable for smaller companies 
And so we've developed SimScale, which is to put in a nutshell the first 100% cloud-based simulation platform, which is running in a standard web browser, which means you don't need to buy any hardware because all your calculations are performed in the cloud. You don't need to buy any software or any licenses because um, everything is delivered to you through the web browser using the SimScale interface. And finally, which may be also the most important thing, uh, you don't need to buy any uh, you don't need to commit an only investment because you can uh, use it on demand. And with SimScale, we basically enable every engineer to access unlimited uh, simulation power through, his, through their web browser. Another very important point is our so-called plan. We, um, our aim was to really democratize this technology. So we have a very special cost model or pricing model, which means everybody can use SimScale basically for free. We have a community plan. And this community plan means that your simulations will become public and can be used by other users as templates. And if you want to have private simulations, we, we offer you tailored pri uh, professional plans where you pay as you go for your simulation, simulation usage. And finally, we wanted to do a simulation platform which is for everyone and therefore it was for us important not only to give you these tools at your fingertips but also to find a solution to train engineers, architects and designers how to get started with simulation. And that's a reason, by the way, why we are hosting workshops like that. All right, and finally, before I give over the word to Per, uh, just maybe two examples or two slides about what you can do with simulation in general. So on this slide you can see just four examples related to architecture uh, of simulations which were performed using the SimScale platform. And there's really a high range starting from wind load prediction, what, where we will t what we will talk about next week, um, where you can like calculate forces acting uh, on the facade of a building, um, also comfort analyzers for wind comfort and pedestrian comfort where you can really investigate virtually um, the flow field around a building inside a city to understand where the uh, risk of, of, of um, uncomfortable wind condition is very high. But you can also use it for more f complex multi-physical effects like if you want to optimize for example ventilation and heating inside large spaces for example in this project simulation of CFD was used to optimize thermal comfort and reduce the energy consumption inside a movie theater. And you can also simulate uh, particles and contamination and for example this project is from one of our customers and it's a company which is an architecture company which is designing and building uh, large parking spaces and they used SimScale to, to predict like um, the local um, uh, concentration of particles and contamination uh, inside this parking house to improve the ventilation. But SimScale is not limited only to fluid flow simulation. Basically, we support all major kinds of physics. So you can also do, um, let's say, structural simulations, analyzing stress and physical loads on, on mechanical designs, uh, which is mainly used in, in, in engine, mechanical engineering industry, but also, for example, if you want, for example, design a very complex facet, it can help you to improve it. Um, you, we also support so-called thermal simulations, so where heat transfer is included, as well as particle simulations. Great, so thank you very much for your attendance, and now I'm very happy to give over the word to Per, who is a very experienced engineer. Per is the co-founder, CEO and chief engineer of Windwind, a Danish uh, consulting company specialized in optimizing um, the interaction between wind and buildings. And today Per will show you how he uses CFD um, to optimize his projects. And yes, I'm very happy that Per made it and had the time and is willing to share his knowledge with us. So thank you very much, Per, and the stage is yours. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Milad. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. I can hear you. I will just uh, make you the presenter. One second. Okay. So, um, can you also see my screen? Yes, everything is working fine. Okay, great. Uh, well, uh, I'm Pierre 
from Win Wind, and uh, we have been uh, doing wind comfort for some years now, and uh, we mainly work in Scandinavia, and uh, and we use Open Foam, which uh, is basically the same uh, engine that uh, is used on uh, the SimScale platform. Uh, when you do a simulation, you get some velocities and pressure and stuff like that. Uh, what we do is uh, translate that into something useful for um, for buildings and uh, urban environments. So we basically take the re results from several wind directions and translate it into comfort criteria. We have developed some uh, preparation tools and, uh, and presentation st uh, stuff uh, that I will go through, and then I will uh, help you get started on uh, doing the, your first uh, estimation of, uh, and well, not estimation of the wind comfort, but uh, give you some, some tools for improving your wind comfort. What is wind comfort? Uh, well, it's subjective. It is something like, uh, <laughs> well, there's a, the comfort element in it. Then there is also a safety element in it so that you don't want people to fall over and uh, break their legs and hips. Um, so in, when you go to the sea, uh, then you expect strong winds. If you are in hot areas, you prefer a little bit of wind to uh, to chill you down. Uh, but when you're in uh, an urban environment, in like in Copenhagen, you prefer uh, to have a uh, calm wind. You you don't want to have uh, too much wind. Other uh, other places in the world, you actually want to have uh, a little bit of wind uh, because you have smog or, or heating or some other problems that can be uh, be helped by a, a, a small amount of wind. But uh, in Europe, generally, you want to uh, lower your wind. Uh, Criteria for wind, well, they are they are uh, they are different from country to country uh, in denmark we have uh, an spe uh, that that states how uh, the the wind uh, comfort criteria should be uh, well it's not law but uh, it, it's a guideline and um, if you want want to sit still you want to have uh, a very very little wind and uh, if you want to have transport areas going from a parking lot to uh, uh, an office you are very tolerant to to more wind um, uh, the the wind is uh, very uh, dependent on turbulence the comfort is uh, uh, when you have uh, turbulence you you get uh, less comfort and uh, so we have a criteria that is the mean speed of the wind plus the uh, the turbulence uh, when you are talking about safety the turbulence is more important so we have uh, three times the standard deviation uh, included in the uh, in, in the safety criteria which is not as which is not which not as displayed here but uh, well, they can be found uh, elsewhere. In the Netherlands, there are some other criteria, uh, and uh, well, just to give you an, an example from a, another country. When doing uh, CFD, you need to have boundary conditions, and uh, your main boundary condition is uh, the velocity, inlet velocity. And the inlet velocity is uh, dependent on how rough uh, the, the far away is. If you're at the sea, uh, near the coast, then you have one side to the sea, which is uh, terrain category zero, which has a profile that looks like this. And uh, it, it rises very rapidly and has not 
very much turbulence in it. Uh, if you have to the other side uh, a, a city, then you uh, might have a terrain category 4, which is uh, <clears throat> a, 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 an urban area. Um, if you have a, a big um, simulation area, uh, the, the, you, you will give, uh, get a, 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 the terrain category implicit from your simulation of the far field. Then you need to have uh, different directions for, uh, for doing your simulation. We often use 12 directions. You can have a little more or, or much more. Uh, you shouldn't go below, uh, let's say, 9 or something like that. Then it will be very, uh, very rough. But if you uh, are doing your first, uh, first studies, you should focus on, on the main wind directions, which is uh, usually in Europe, the western wind directions, because that is, the, the, that is where you will get your, uh, the main discomfort uh, uh, stuff. Uh, so if you're doing the, the if you're, you're doing the, the early design process, not doing the full statistics uh, like we're doing here, then you should uh, go for the, uh, the main wind directions. And if you are looking at the, uh, at the other wind directions, you, uh, you, you, would, you don't need to have the, the same, crit you don't need to be quite as critic about the other directions, directions as the main direction. Remember, you don't get the criteria directly from uh, CFD but the velocity, which is proportional to the comfort uh, when you have the statistics, uh, the right statistics on it. Um, the orientation of the, your area is very important. Here we have uh, made a, a small fantasy village uh, or city. Uh, where we have it uh, turned to the, the a Vestal Coast, and then we did the same city and uh, switch it over to having an Eastal Coast. And uh, in these areas uh, near the coast, when you have a Vestal West, Coast, you see uh, uh, very uh, discomfort. You have uh, only good for strolling but uh, you don't have any places uh, with a view where you can sit and uh, have, a, have a cup of coffee, coffee or a read a newspaper. Whereas when you have it to uh, the coastal area to the east, you have small pockets of, uh, of good comfort, especially near the, near the, near the wall. When you're analyzing your uh, your uh, problem areas, uh, streamlines are often nice to uh, uh, to indicate where does the problem arise. Uh, if you have an area uh, in here, for instance, you would guess that uh, your wind would come from uh, from near the coast. But if you follow the, the streamlines here, you see that it comes in and then turns around the building going under the, the streamlines, the streamlines that, co that comes more directly from the coast. So uh, the streamlines can tell you where and how your problem uh, arises. Here you have uh, 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 um, uh, interior of... Uh, of the Calais, uh, where the wind comes, it comes through the uh, through a port, and uh, then um, makes a lot of uh, edges inside the uh, uh, the the goal. <laughs> I can't remember that right now, but uh, it is a very good tool for uh, for for, lo for identifying your problems, and uh, then solve it by, for instance 
put uh, put some doors in the, in this port, um, or put up some trees uh, when you uh, trees here that can dissipate the uh, the wind. Another very nice tool is uh, the uh, contours, uh, where you set a, a contour threshold. And uh, now I have set it around some uh, mo mo modest uh, comfort. And uh, here you can see that uh, in, in these areas here you would have uh, quite uh, good wind comfort, so you can uh, you can put up some balconies uh, quite high here, whereas uh, here you would have uh, nice penthouses with uh, excellent view, but the, there is no wind comfort at all, all there. So you, do, you don't have a, a, a useful balcony there. When you're doing the uh, your, your CFD, you need to think uh, of uh, model quality differently than when you do your, your design and, uh, and, and concept uh, models, because you're often, often interested in presenting your pre uh, results visually when you're doing your design. Whereas uh, in, in CFD, it's very important that uh, you don't have uh, holes in it, so so you have uh, very uh, you have some very good uh, models which are closed meshes and solids. They are often uh, just perfect to put right into a CFD uh, program. Uh, a lot of uh, meshing technology requires it to be closed and solid and uh, a very high quality. But uh, the snappy hex mesh uh, is more tolerant, and uh, it can uh, do well with uh, as long as you don't have uh, holes in your surface, so you get uh, wind into your building. Uh, when you have a, a model, you, you often need to fix it uh, in. Uh, in our work, we often have a model for an an area, and then we need to have the surrounding terrain. And luckily, we have a public available point cloud of Denmark that we can use for that. Uh, so uh, I will show you how to uh, to make a, a a rough model of your uh, of a surrounding area. Then your uh, your architectural models uh, may be uh, uh, not of sufficient quality, having holes and um, and floating in mid-air, uh, and I'll show how to, to re repair such meshes. Uh, you can have other problems uh, like uh, uh, poly surfaces that has gaps in it, and cap can use be useful there, and uh, and if it's it is uh, uh, very bad, you have to remodel uh, with uh, solids. Here we have a, a point cloud um, that I will uh, quick, I have recorded this so I don't need to uh, don't search for the button instead of explaining what's doing, what I'm doing here. I take the um, a point, a, a bitmap and uh, define a terrain and that is uh, that is the ground, and this terrain uh, is uh, converted into a, a mesh, and uh, and then I reduce the mesh to get uh, more explicit structure and uh, make it make it smaller. Uh, after uh, having uh, made my terrain, I make a copy of it, and then. Uh, uh, put it uh, a meter below uh, the other terrain and use that as a, a ground uh, ground for for draping the um, the other elements of the point cloud. So now we have a, 
a copy of the terrain and uh, and it's um, it's being moved down to one meter below uh, the other one and then the the first one is uh, turned off and now we are looking at uh, the building layers uh, the, well the building point cloud and uh, making a building layer so we take the building point clouds and the the lower terrain and then we take a drape over that and um, take it as fine as we can and uh, just uh, drag over the the points that we want to um, to drape then it's converted into a mesh and uh, the drape is deleted after uh, after the mesh is made we also uh, refine the mesh to make it smaller and to uh, make the uh, structure more explicit if you need to edit uh, afterwards it's much better to uh, to, to edit uh, the reduced mesh because it it has the shape of the buildings uh, then we, uh, if you have uh, the vegetation in your uh, in your simulation, you can also uh, make a, a, a rough model of your um, vegetation. Trees are often very useful for uh, for high uh, for for getting better wind comfort because it dissipates the uh, the wind it creates uh, early turbulence that uh, reduces the tendency to have big uh, big eddies that are annoying. So uh, so trees are are very nice when you you need to solve uh, problems with your wind environment. So now we have. Uh, reduced uh, the uh, vegetation and uh, our final uh, model is uh, is here with uh, the terrain buildings and and, uh, and trees when you have uh, your architectural model you, you, you probably have uh, a very nice rendering of it but uh, you don't uh, have uh, maybe your facades are floating or your ho house is uh, just uh, 10 centimeters above ground and that can be very disturbing for the CFD simulation. So I uh, tried to, um, to show the naked edges and holes in uh, the model and then uh, just use the fill hole uh, mesh fill to uh, remove the uh, the mesh holes and uh, if there are not many uh, holes that that's a very quick process but with a big model it can be quite time consuming but uh, here we have then uh, our building floating so if we turn on points uh, control points we can take the the lower control points and uh, move them below the the surface and um, get a, a, a measure get a model that that can be used for uh, for CFD we have um, uh, often uh, and and uh, and city area like this, where we have a region in the uh, in the center that we we are interested in, and then we make uh, a fine simulation in, in the, the close area and a, a rougher simulation in the, in the in the far area. That can save quite some time in simulation. So. Uh, thank you, and uh, now I'll uh, give over the mic to uh, Milad. Thanks, Pea, for this great presentation.
and we have some questions uh, which I would like directly to answer, which I think are, are, are directed to you. So uh, the first question is by Felix, and or Felix, and uh, Felix asks if there are any techniques or geometries one can use to reduce wind speed or act as a windbreakers or diffusers. Uh, spoilers are great, <laughs> but, they're not, but they're probably not great in architecture often. <laughs> but uh, well, it is. It is understanding what the architect wants, and then uh, there is a range of uh, elements that, that you can use. Uh, rooftops, uh, half roofs, and, uh, and diffusing areas, and, and a lot of things, and, and you, you need to, to uh, understand uh, the, the architectural vision uh, to, to find the, the right solution. Uh, so so it's uh, it's difficult to give a concrete shape that is uh, that solves every problem. But I think pair one of the big advantages of CFD is that for a lot of lot of times you can actually um, solve problems like that without adding any additional geometry just by you know. Um, slightly changing, for example, the shape of a facade, something like that. Oh, yes. And then the, a lot of our work is uh, being uh, creative together with the, the architect and, and find out what, what are the possible changes. How can we close this, uh, this space without uh, ruining the, the, the architectural vision? And uh, and it is a creative pro process, uh, and, and and we can test we can test it, uh, and that's why CFD is so great. And and, and for that, you only need uh, a single width direction where you have the problem. Ah, yeah, well, yeah, exactly. you often... We will in ten minutes. I will show you an mm. example which I think will answer Felix's question, which really shows how you can reduce, for example, big areas of, of um, wind uncomfort with very small cha changes. And I think that's also the point about aerodynamics, right? That very small dis dis disturbances can affect very, very large changes. Yeah, yeah. and rotating a building, uh, so uh, the, the, the downwash is, uh, is flushed out to uh, and uninteresting area is a good thing, uh, and uh, yeah. So, so you really be need to be imaginative <laughs> to to find out what are your possibilities. All right, thanks, Pear. We have so many more questions. I would just like to to read out two of them right now because they're quite related to this uh, Rhino work, and all the other questions will be answered later during the Q and A, guys. So don't worry. And the next question is by Vasilik, and he wants to need know if you necessarily need a point cloud to create the terrain. Oh, no, no, no. But uh, I, I took a point cloud because it's uh, often quite annoying to, to make into a mesh. Uh, so, so that was uh, uh, just an, a, a, an annoying example that, uh, that I came up, uh, that I showed a solution for. But uh, often you you can get, have a, 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 a mesh model supplied from uh, 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 from some other maybe Google. <laughs> yes, I think there are a lot of, of possibilities. The reason why we include this demo is that. Uh, let's say all the tools architects are using traditionally are not made to create solid models and I think Pear really showed quickly a very smart way to create the, 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 this solid models you need but for, for sure I think for other other situations there are also other possibilities to create these models. In the end of the day you just have to make sure your model is watertight and closed. Yeah. All right, so let's. I would now like to to show you a live demo, uh, how you can use SimScale to set up such a, a wound comfort analysis very quickly, and then in the end we will discuss about the remaining question, guys. So don't worry. All right, P 
prepare. I will just make myself the presenter again, and we will talk again in 10 minutes, I think. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so far. Okay. Great. Um, all right. Can you see my screen? Yes. All right. Then let's get started. Yes. Um, right now, I would like to show you how you can set up such a simulation on your own using the SimScale platform. Therefore, let's switch to, to SimScale. And this is um, basically, that's, that's SimScale. So it's a web-based solution. You just have to enter simscale.com and then you can create a free account. And I have prepared something in my so-called dashboard. So this is like um, the place on SimScale where I can find all my own simulation projects. And here I've already prepared a WinComfort analysis. So let's switch into that project. And here we go. So this is everything we are doing now is happening live in a web browser. So, um, and as you see, it's it's basically an interactive three-dimensional environment. So it's it's really like using a, a, a standard a local tool. But keep in mind, everything we're doing here is happening in the cloud, which means we will never lose any data. And here you can see the model I've uploaded. It was also created um, using Rhino. And in this case, I didn't include a Terran because we will use a flat Terran later for this demonstration purpose. And first of all, let me show you how easy it is to upload a geometry. So you just go on geometries, upload, and then you can select uh, which kind of file you will import. And SimScale supports some very, let's say, uh, exchange data formats like SAP, INGES, and STL, as well as native for file formats for a lot of CAD tools like SolidWork, the whole Autodesk family, and Rhino. And you can easily just upload the model click on start, this type is the STL file, and then this model will be uploaded, which can take some, some seconds depending on the internet connection. And once this step is finished, your model is in the cloud in our system. It's by the way encrypted, so nobody else can access it. And from now, from then on, you can easily set up everything. Right, I have already uploaded the model, it's looking like that. And let's just take a quick look at the model structure. So basically, we have created three closed surface sets. One surface set is including the building we are interested in the end of the day. It's this train station here in the middle. And um, this one. And then we also created a group for large buildings and for small details. And the reason is that it will uh, make our job easier later. Because, as you know, we should define different accuracy levels, different mesh sizes for different regions. And this will help us to, to set up the mesh quite easily. And if you want to set up a mesh, you just need to create, click a new mesh button, choose the geometry in our type of the city model, and then you can add a mesh operation. We have a lot of different mesh operations for different problems. And in this case, we suggest to use the so-called hex-dominant parametric measure, which gives you full control and allows you to divide your model into a lot of small subcells. But we also have full automatic version where you don't need to add any uh, manual user commands. And let me just, just take a look how this will look like. So uh, this is a very generic mesh project. And let's just take a look at the structure. So basically, you just have to define, first of all, what is the outer, let's say, the outer boundaries of a fluid domain. So we will investigate everything which is happening inside this domain, inside this cube. You can also define refinement zones, like here, where we added a huge mesh refinement in the near of the floor because we're accepting, uh, ex expecting that there will a lot of, 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 of changes happen. And you can add different mesh sizes to different parts of your model, like you can use for this um, smaller buildings, we use a finer mesh, this number representing the fineness. So uh, five is two times finer than level four and so on. And we can also define mesh refinements for whole regions 
and even add refinements in the near of surfaces. And once this is done, you just click on Start and your mesh will be automatically calculated. And the great thing is that right now we are using 32 cores to calculate this mesh, and it will take around one hour, which means on a standard workstation with one CPU, it would take more than one day. And that's the great thing about the cloud. Everything is happening uh, uh, on our systems, and you never need to think about your computation power or your hardware. And now let's just take a look. So uh, first of all, here you can see the rendered uh, model. And in red, you can see the train station, which we want to investigate. And you can imagine, since a lot of people are coming out and in, here the wind comfort, especially the pedestrian wind comfort, is very important. And this is the final mesh, which we created. And you can see that the mesh was automatically refined in the near of edges, everywhere where we expect to have high changes of, of, of uh, air, air speed and, and air pressure. And this is a very important process, because here we are defining which accuracy we want to use. And once the mesh was defined, it can take some time until it's calculated. So let's take a look at the finalized mesh, which will now load. And then we can really take a look into the mesh and interact with the mesh and so on. Next step is to set up the actual simulation. And there it's quite easy. You just click on New Simulation, Fluid Flow, Incompressible. Then there's even a kind of, of template for, for buildings. You can just open this one here. There you will find a very nice um, kind of uh, tutorial related to this analysis type, especially for buildings. And we just can choose it now, create a new simulation. The default settings are fine. These are about the turbulence model we use, which is necessary to s resolve the very small uh, turbulent structures. Then we just have to choose a mesh. Add a material. Don't, don't worry. So this is still the right mesh. This is our fluid domain. And let's change with change to surfaces. Then we just have to add the material we want to use in this example of air. Add it to our simulation. Click on save. And now the only missing thing is to define boundary conditions. And this depends on, on what you want to simulate. In a very easy example, um, we just need an inlet and the outlet for the air. And since this can take some time, um, uh, also to calculate it, I've prepared everything and also prepared a finished simulation. So if you defined everything, you can just start the simulation. And this simulation run for two hours on 32 cores. And then you can see like the accuracy of your simulation. So this is like the average error, which goes down and down. And for example, for the pressure, the average error in the field at the end is less than 0.04%. And once this is done, we can even take a look at the 3D simulation results um, in our live uh, post-processing environment on SimScale. And let's go back to the slide. This really shows the big, big strengths of CFD. So basically, here we have the architecture model on the left side. On the right side, we have visualization of the simulation results. And you can see it's exactly the same geometry, only some, some minor, minor details um, were simplified. And now we can really take a look at every corner, at every point of the buildings, and uh, understand uh, why the air is, is, is streaming like it is. And yes, that's really one of the biggest advantages of SimScale. Let me just give you an idea. Once the simulation was set up, with one click you can change the wind direction and investigate like the effect of the wind direction on the building, just like Per demonstrated at the beginning. And this is, for example, in this case, the, the uh, air is coming from, from northern direction. 
and you can see that there are some kinds of hotspots. So the legend is representing the, the velocity and blue is very low, it's uh, around zero meters per second, it's, if it's really dark blue and dark red means six meters per second or higher. You can see that we have some hotspots like here or here or even here. And in these areas, the wind speed is like two or three times higher than uh, around. So if someone is walking inside this red zone, he will feel very uncomfortable. It will be very windy. And if someone crosses this line and, and walks, for example, from this blue area into this red area, this can be a big surprise for him because suddenly there will be very high uh, wind speeds and wind loads acting on him. And if we change the wind direction, like now it's coming from, from the east side, you can see that the whole flow topology changed. And now we have some diff we still have this hotspot, but they're not anymore here, they are now mainly on the right side. So again, take a look, and now here everything is basically fine, but now we have here a, like a hotspot of, of very high flow, uh, fluid flow velocity, here at the corner, and especially here in this area, which is really horrible if you think about it. Another wind direction now coming from southern direction and now you can see again that it completely changed. We don't have any any high uh, velocity areas on the right side but now here on the left side especially here uh, on the uh, on the southern side of our map. And if we now take a look at wind coming from western side, we have the same effect that we uh, saw with, with the eastern side, that like we have a lot of hot spots on the sides the wind is coming from here. And if you think about it, this is maybe the worst um, situation where we have this very large areas of, of high velocity on the left side, but also around this building, this big area. All right, um, sorry. Now let's try to understand how the simulation results can help us. Um, and therefore let's take a look at some of this, this uh, uh, details of the fluid flow. And that's the great thing, by the way, about CFD. All these images can be created with one click and we can really dive in into every detail. So again, uh, we have the velocity represented by the colors. And for example, here you can see this, this really big area of of high high velocity and this is the train station we were interested in so basically here are the the, um, the gates for the train and as you can see people are leaving here the train station around this area and this is really a big problem it's not only related to to comfort but also to safety and here and here we will have a lot of, of, of bad discomfort areas now let's take a look at, at this picture and, and this is really interesting and I hope that um, this will also answer a little bit the question of Felix from the beginning. So again this is our train station, I hope you can see it here, you can also see a train and um, this area, this yellow area here is not very good. Here we'll have a low comfort and high wind load and just imagine if it's really windy it's even dangerous. If you have an umbrella for example, I think you all know these videos, it's even possible that, that this uh, is the reason for an incident. And coming back on Felix's question, so what can we, how can we modify the building here to, to uh, reduce that problem and the answer is actually we can't because for this area, the reason is not the building, the reason is that are these two buildings here. Because here you can see we have this really this high velocity area, which means that we also have a low pressure area here. And this low pressure area here, it's sucking the air from this side and that's the reason why we have this uh, high uh, air velocities here. So if we really want to solve the problem here, we maybe need to do a modification here because this is what we call a Venturi effect, two converging surfaces and the air gets accelerated. And the, really this effect goes downstream 
uh, and upstream and affects also the flow around this building. And that's really the great thing about CFD, that it really shows you, helps you to understand the complex interaction between buildings or, or, or parts of a building. Um, here's another good, next good example for, for this um, Venturi effect. Here you can see it like uh, how the air gets accelerated here in this small gap. Right, now let's make it a little bit more hands-on and take a look at three problems uh, when it comes to optimize wind comfort and how we can analyze and understand them with CFD. The first thing I would like to talk about is the so-called passage effect, uh, which uh, Pear also mentioned during his, his demo where he showed you uh, the building where you had these big eddies uh, 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 inside the building and, and inside this, this, this garden. And just imagine this is a, a skyscraper or two skyscrapers and if you take a look um, we have a gate here. Let's zoom a little bit so and this is uh, like an opening maybe for, for, for pedestrians who just want to, to, to cross the street or just want to uh, go to the other building and they can take um, this short way through the gate. But this gate has also an effect on the aerodynamics of the building and on the wind comfort. And if we now do a fluid flow simulation, you can see what is happening. So in this case, the wind is coming from this side. So wind is coming from here. This is the wind direction. And the first building is creating a kind of wake. And the second building is inside the slip steam of the first building. And the result is the reason is or the result of this is that we have this very big uh, wind still area behind the buildings. But if you take a closer look, you can see that here is a red zone. And this is basically like a jet. So the air flows into this gate, and then again the um, gate becomes smaller and it's now it's working basically like a jet. And this jet is quite dangerous because you see we have a very rapid change of, of wind velocity. And if somebody, for example, is, is crossing here now and, and under very uh, uncomfortable circumstances, and if it's very windy, uh, this is really a, a problem for the safety. And now using CFD, we can really predict how this jet will look like for different uh, main wind directions. And, and try to optimize uh, some details around the building or at the surface of the building to reduce this effect. And another effect which is quite familiar and similar to the passage effect is the Venturi effect, but why the passage effect is only happening if you have like a gate or an opening or a hole inside a wall, the Venturi effect can also uh, uh, occur uh, between buildings, like we talked about, like you can see it here. So here, for example, uh, uh, there's a, a cross section between the buildings, so the, the free space where the flow can stream becomes smaller and smaller, and necessarily the air gets accelerated. Or also very important, the so-called uh, corner effect, uh, and a lot of times, um, basically, uh, the corner effect is the reason for, for disturbances of the flow field, because a building is like a bluff body. And once the air hits the building, uh, at the corners, um, uh, we generate, the building starts to generate vortices and ed eddies. And this generates the upstream and the downstream side. And let me try to draw it if it's possible. So you can see that here we have like a water. And this is happening because the air can't follow the high pressure gradient. You see here we have a, like here um, the air, air is coming and then it separates from the building on the edge. And then the fourth flow is, is what we call down or upwash. It's like turning into the geometry. And in these areas, we not only have very high flow velocities or air speeds, but also we have a, a very high grade of variation of the f and fluctuation of the air speed. So it's really what we call windy and uncomfortable. 
All right, um, it seems like we're still on time, so I would like to thank you first of all for joining us for, for this workshop series and I really hope you enjoyed it and, and learned something from it. And before we start with the Q&A, just some final words from my side. So as we mentioned, this is the course and tomorrow uh, we will send you an email including the recording of the session and, and some, some material you can read to, to deep uh, the knowledge you've gained about CFD building aerodynamics. And it's up to you. If you want, you can really take this as a course and uh, get feedback. We will also open dedicated forum section where you can get in touch with our engineers and get supports for free. And during this time, and all, all the time, feel free to answer questions, ask questions and uh, everything you're interested in. And we also mentioned that's a possibility to get a certification and together with the recording tomorrow we will send you a link to a very short and crisp quiz and answering all the questions for all three sessions will qualify you for a certification of participation. Okay, great. And now we have a lot of questions what I would like to answer. And let's just start with Piotr. Piotr wants to know if we can create an animation of moving particles. Yes, that's for sure possible. You can create a lot of animations like moving planes, moving streamlines and moving particles which can be very impressive and help also to, to sell an idea or a concept to a customer. And Piotr, if you're interested in that, please um, just send me an email and I will forward some, some interesting material to you, which you can also find on our website. Then, um, the next question is by Diego Mendes. Uh, maybe this is also related to PEAR. Do you have any advice demos for regions of the world where the building envelopes are configured to be less hermetic? For example, in Costa Rica, architectural envelopes would be more open and a designer here might want to do the opposite to what a designer um, Sorry, to uh, uh, what a designer would do in continental climates. Um, I don't have examples here, but uh, but but uh, but you definitely just need to do the opposite. <laughs> so so you need to uh, to find the the wind direction that are uh, that. Are not dominant. Uh, well, they, they ha it has to be frequent from that direction, but slow winds, and then you need to uh, have your uh, you acceler accelerated these slow winds, uh, and then you can use uh, the Venturi effect or uh, or other uh, effects uh, as you you mentioned before. But it is uh, kind of the the, the opposite uh, exercise. Does that answer the question? I think so. In the case not, Diego, please feel free to, to specify your question or add a detail. In the meantime, there are some more questions. One is by uh, uh, Sushant. And Sushant wants to know if we can export analysis data to grasshoppers through any medium as numbers, geometry, with call, etc. Yes, Sushant, that's possible. At all the time, you can download all the data on SimScale, even the mesh, modified geometries, and for sure simulation results and analyzers. Actually, we encourage our customers to also download the data and try to include them into the other tools, and especially this, this uh, contours of pressure streamlines can be easily exported as VRML files or STL files and imported into other tools like Rhino or Grasshopper. And there's also a question by Mark Johnson, which is quite similar. He wants to know if SimScale uh, dovetail with other Rhino plugins like Diver for Reno, which carries out daylighting and energy modeling for Grasshopper, and if SimScale models the airflow inside interior spaces of buildings, especially as of uh, especially as one might wish to model stack effects at high-rise building. Mark, thank you very much for the question. First of all, um, our collaboration with Rhino and McNeil is quite deep, but also very young. We just joined forces some months ago because we received so many requests from architects. So, um, so far we don't have any plugin for Rhino, but we already integrated the Rhino format to our platform that, so that you can upload directly your Rhino models. And for sure, SimScale can model the airflow inside interior spaces of buildings. You can basically model the airflow uh, 
inside everything you want. And we even have some customers using SimScale, especially for optimizing um, ventilation and airflow and heating in high-rise buildings. Um, then some people said they uh, joined too late for the webinar. Uh, don't worry, guys. As I mentioned, we will record this. We recorded this webinar, and we will send you tomorrow a link to the recording. And there are some some more questions. So let's get some structure in, in, into it. Um, Okay, another question by Piotr. What is the finest detail and scale of a large building the simulation is reliable and able to compute? Example given balcony. Per, do you want to answer this question? Well, it depends on, uh, on your mesh. <laughs> I think you can... Uh, if you go to uh, very fine detail, uh, you should uh, go to a dynamic simulation, uh, which will take quite a longer uh, time to simulate. Uh, so so the, the, this static picture is probably limited to, uh, well, roughly a, a meter maybe. <laughs> um, but if you have, um, if you if you want to have the the the, the effects on the facade, you need to have dynamic dynamic simulations and uh, and a very fine mesh, and, and then it's only compute time. Yeah, it really depends on 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 the user basically. If you want, you can even consider the small screws which are used to attach the balcony to the house. It's possible. But if you use such a small scale, you will resolve a lot of unnecessary details and your simulation will take months or years. And that's the reason, and that's the art of CFD basically. And that's maybe also your role as an architect, that you need to understand what is important and what not. But basically you can simulate every detail you want, but at some point it won't be, uh, let's say, um, it, 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 it won't make sense anymore at some point if you more and more refine your mesh. Then but, but if you are if you are very interested in a, a certain detail, I would suggest that you make an isolated uh, simulation for that. Yeah, that's that makes sense. That's a very good strategy to to uh, really divide your problem into small problems and try to simplify everything as much as possible. Then there is a question by David. And Dawit uh, wants to know, regarding the SimScale cloud, very heavy calculations can be solved on the cloud or does the software use the machine memory? Uh, David, ev all the calculation, everything is uh, performed in the cloud. So you don't need to, to uh, worry regarding your machine and the performance of your machine. Uh, and basically the only point where we use your computer is to upload the results and to provide you with the interface to the cloud through your web browser. Then, um, okay, let's see, some questions are repeating. Yes, Diego wants to know, are there any rules of thumb to determine, determine the relevant area of influence for a simulation? Well, you need to... Uh, uh, if you think about the... the uh, the live demo, uh, all the area effects uh, are probably basically uh, probably mainly because of uh, the size of the the surrounding areas uh, and the inlet conditions. So, uh, so if you uh, if you you want to have uh, the effect in the each of your area, you need to have a lot of uh, surrounding areas uh, to, to to get the right boundary conditions. Uh, so uh, a rule of thumb would be to have uh, uh, maybe five times the five times the diameter in each direction of the area of interest. Uh, well. Uh, that's just loosely <laughs> taken, but uh, you need to have uh, more than double the radius. So if you have a an area that is 100 meters, then 
300 meters uh, of simulation uh, is definitely too small and um, and well uh, 10 kilometers are probably uh, too too much <laughs> Yes, again, it's a trade-off like everywhere. So uh, the perfect simulation is as small and as possible, but as detailed as necessary. And here again, it's the case. So um, at some point, you will notice that increasing your the fluid flow domain, the distance to the, the simulation walls, will at some point not anymore really affect the results. And then you know that's exactly the right distance. But this is something related to, uh, I would say, to experience also, right? After mm. using simulation for some time, you will develop a kind of feeling for the right settings. <laughs> okay, then another question by David. And so uh, also if if we are planning to have a grasshopper integration. Yes, right now we are in touch with McNeil and Rhino to, to find out what is the best way to... to um, integrate SimScale into Rhino and the other way around. And right now we are working on different solutions. But the great thing about SimScale is that um, based on our, our cloud approach and our uh, huge compatibility with different data files, um, a lot of, of settings will be automatically, um, or a lot of, of problems will be automatically solved um, by our platform, even without that integration. But we are working on it, and as soon as there are any news, we will... Uh, announce it in our blog and you will hear about it. Okay, then um, some some other questions. A lot of people asked uh, what was it if uh, if if we can change the position of the plane I used in my in my in my presentation of these planes. And yes for sure you can basically interactive in your simulation in real time move these planes and really investigate every centimeter of your fluid flow and because also and you can put it per perpendicular to it so you can see at what height you you have your problem yeah exactly you can it's really like just imagine uh, the world would stop and you would run around the city with uh, with a with a measuring device and you would be able to to measure everything everywhere that's really the, the big thing about cfd and a lot of people ask why i didn't use trees in the in my simulation. The answer is very very simple and short. Uh, it is just a demo, and it would be possible to include trees. Would just add some more complexity. And since this was the very first demo, we thought we will keep it simple. But for sure, you can also add trees and everything else you're interested in. And um, let's see if there are some more questions. Ah. Pavel wants to know, what is the output of the simulation? Just a gradient image or a data file? Pavel, that's a very good question. And actually, um, the output of our simulation, you can imagine as a very big table where you will find for every defined point in your model, in x, y, and z direction, the related pressure and velocity. So we are really calculating and providing you with the full 3D data. And you can create images based on them directly on our cloud platform but you can also download them and use them in some other tools and process them further in, in, in other tools um, okay and that's a very very good question and then I think we should come to an end because uh, we're running out of time but um, the next question is by um, Jerole my question is that how you will increase the comfort for the pedestrian for an existing city which was not well planned? And what... Uh, pair? That's a very good question. Oh. <laughs> yeah, that is uh, actually uh, something that uh, we, uh, uh, we, 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 we do. Uh, and um, 